Uh, he was in, at, in Berlin at the time, a German surgeon. He was going to present his results at a convention in, in uh, Paris. And for that, he developed a skeleton that had all of his implants in it. And just before he was to go to the Congress, uh, the professor, the big professor in Berlin told him, no, you can't go, it will embarrass us if you present this. The skeleton had already been sent. It was exhibited at that Congress and at several more con Congresses in France and uh, became known as the Paris Skeleton. It then became part of the Berlin collection of medicine, which had all of Verkau and the great German physicians exhibits were in that. And it was there until the end of World War II when the Red Army took the entire Berlin collection to Russia and it's never been seen since. The real start of arthroplasty in the modern era was uh, Marius Nygaard Smith Peterson, a Norwegian who immigrated to the US when he was 11 or 12 years old, graduated from Harvard, uh, started his surgical training uh, with Harvey Cushing at uh, Harvard. And uh, he was a very inventive and prolific guy. Put this in your hat to think about. In his internship year, he developed the Smith-Peterson, the anterior approach to the hip, which became known as the Smith-Peterson approach and is one of the most widely used hip approaches around. He later developed the Smith-Peterson spinal osteotomy, uh, primarily for patients with the rheumatoid spondylitis that still had some motion in their disc, and he would do this posterior osteotomy. Obviously, there was no hardware to close it with in those days. He put them on a hyperextension cast and closed it down uh, and restored lordosis. He developed the Smith-Peterson nail, it's a triflange nail. It, had, it was unique in that it was cannulated, so you could put a Steinman pin into the uh, fracture area and get an image to see where you're going to be driving your Smith Pete nail so it wasn't blind. Uh, he was trying to solve the problem of the femoral neck fracture, and this became the standard treatment for a long, long period of time. Thornton thought up adding this side plate, and the combination of the Smith Pete nail and Thornton side plate was the standard treatment for intertrochanteric hip fractures well into the 60s. I scrubbed on several cases that used this as a means of treating an intertroch, and they worked pretty darn well. But we're here to talk about his mold or cup arthroplasty. He, uh, He had the concept that if he interposed a uh, biocompatible material between an arthritic head and an arthritic acetabulum, that if he ground out the arthritis on both sides, that from the trabecular bone that was left, cartilage would develop over time. He got this idea supposedly from taking a piece of glass out of a person's back and noting that it was there was no foreign body reaction and there was a synovial-like uh, tissue around it with some fluid in it. He did do some animal experimentation before he started putting them in humans. He started, though, with what he thought, or what to him was the only available biocompatible material at the time, 1923, he started with glass. And his concept was he would have the cup made of glass, put it in, leave it for about a year, then take it out and let the person ambulate with the newly formed cartilage. Unfortunately, uh, I think in the first, he did eight cases and all eight of them, the glass broke long before he ever had a chance to take it out. He abandoned that and went to Viscoloid in 1925. This was a, an early plastic 
Uh, it didn't work. It ended up being not biocompatible. Uh, he did a number of cases with that. He then turned to Pyrex, which had just came out, new form of glass, supposed to be very tough. It was, uh, he thought it would be the answer for him. It wasn't. He then tried Bakelite. Uh, Bakelite was the first fully synthetic plastic ever made. Uh, it primarily came out for uh, household goods used in the kitchen. I used to could always refer to Bakelite because when I was a resident, beside every bed, on every bed stand in the VA hospital, was an ashtray made of Bakelite. <laughs> Those are long gone, so I can't refer to them now. But, uh, finally, in 1938, he uh, got onto Vitalium, uh, Cone Cobralt, it was suggested to him by his dentist, and uh, he started having them made by the Austin Company. I just happened to have run across this advert, and that's not an advertisement, just out of a catalog of the OEC company in about 1940, which showed they were selling the Vitalium ones, but they were showing the others. The copper molo arthroplasty was the standard arthroplasty in the United States well into 1970. Uh, it uh, had some problems, though, as you can see in this patient, this is a young rheumatoid arthritic. Uh, this is the first film is about a year post-op on her, and it, the next one is a couple of years post-op. See how much the implants have both migrated into the pelvis and have settled on top of the thermal head. Osseous necrosis under the cup was a standard complication, and it was... Uh, kind of accepted. These, some people referred to these as interpositional arthrofibrosis because they got stiff and this occurred. There were some issues related to the cup. The patients were hospitalized for three months, six months in traction, six months of intensive physical therapy. I felt obligated to show you traction because I doubt that you've ever seen it. Uh, this is the standard balance suspension. It was the standard way for taking care of the cup because it was felt it took the pressure off of the, the hip joint and let them move around. It was our standard way of treating uh, femoral fractures when we put a pin in either the femur or the proximal tibia and of treating tibial fractures by putting the pin in the os calcis. It was great for profound fractures. This is a what used to be a very widely used thing in orthopedics. Uh, the other issue was that there was a 50% failure rate with the procedure after three months of hospitalization. Failure defined as pain and discomfort worse than before surgery. They had an 8 to 12% deep infection rate. 50% of the patients that thought they were successful had to use a cane to walk without a Trendelenburg gate. As a partial answer to this, in the late, in 1938, Austin Moore uh, and Dr. Bowman tried making, did make, a custom-made endoprosthesis for the hip uh, and put it in a patient in 1938. Austin Moore from South Carolina continued on with this, using it more for femoral neck fracture. And he did a number of cases. He got the Depew Corporation to make these out of cast Vitalium. But he didn't have many in when World War uh, II erupted and it stopped. About the same time he developed that implant, Fred Thompson in New York developed this implant again for treating femoral neck fractures. Both press fit, both Vitalium. In England, 1938, Philip Wilde, the Middlesex Hospital, uh, had this hip fabricated and inserted it in six patients. He did not get any follow-up on any of the six patients because of the war, intervening war, uh, but it, it was generally thought they didn't do well. Uh, he did resume doing it after World War II with this implant, and again, it did not perform as well as he thought it would. 
Jude in Paris, who was a very prominent uh, orthopedic surgeon, just before World War II, 1938, started using this hip. It was made of plexiglass, a very, very new substance. Plexiglass is polymethyl methacrylate formed under very high heat and pressure. Uh, it became widely used in the fighter aircraft and in all aircraft uh, in World War II. Uh, he thought that it would be an ideal implant. He did not put many in before the war started and made no real reports on them. World War II came, things pretty much stopped for seven years, eight years. After the war in the United States, cup arthroplasty resumed. Unfortunately, the same old problems occurred that had been seen before the war. Uh, and for a lot of patients, a group of surgeons started trying the either the Austin Moore press fit or the Freddie Thompson press fit as a at arthroplasty. Unfortunately, as you see, it migrated on this patient in a couple of years, and they loosened. These were no more successful than up, and they were managed the same way. Three months hospitalization. Yes, sir. The question is, what was the coating on the outside? There was no coating. It was a, it was cast, and then the casting, the ball part was polished, and the uh, stem was either partially polished or grit blasted with sand. But it had no, no concept that there would be on growth onto it. It was assumed that there would be no on growth, uh, that it would just sit there neutral. And the problem was distributing load out of it, it didn't happen. And so the, the high points would start to, to absorb and maybe get loose. Uh, after the war, Jude resumed his activities and did 800 cases, uh, all of which are reported to have failed, as you see here, uh, within four years. 800 cases. In England, there developed a, a unique interest in the total hip by regional surgeons. These were the surgeons that were out in the National Health Service in their hinterland hospitals. Uh, the orthopedic surgeons. And it's, it's a unique story because the reason that these people developed, Ridington with, with Chardonnay, Norwich with McKee, uh, the Stanmore hip, Exter with Lean, the reason they, these guys could all work was because during World War II, the Brits could not have their manufacturing for aircraft centralized because the Germans would bomb it. So they put out all across England, small machine shops, each one of which would manufacture. One would manufacture a carburetor. The next one would manufacture part of a propeller hub, et cetera. And after World War II, these guys were needing work and they were starting to branch out in making other things. But the orthopedic surgeons that were in their areas started thinking about hips. McGee at, at, up at Norfolk had prototyped that hip in 1940, but not put it in a patient. After the war, he started putting in a, the hip you see on the right, which is a press fit Freddie Thompson prosthesis. And his concept was that it was metal on metal, that the acetabular component had those little spikes on it. And by driving them into the hip, it would stay in place. Charnley at Ridington is given credit for the total hip and he deserves it. Uh, he wasn't Sir John Charnley at the end of the war. Uh, he was a very innovative, unusual guy, like most of the people. He thought a lot about a lot of things. He wrote a book, The Closed Treatment of Common Fractures, that was the textbook in the English-speaking world for a number of years. Four editions, widely so. That's one of his quotes in the, in the preface 
uh, which I think is pretty pretty good. And uh, in this day and age, when you guys never see anything go into plaster, uh, it's worth looking at. And reading his books is worth looking at. He was a strong advocate of arthrodesis for painful joints, and he developed the compression apparatus you see here, charming the clamp, widely, widely used, uh, and we could go on, on and on about it, uh, but, well, but it, he was very, and he wrote about it a lot. He did try, in 1958, a double cup total hip with polytetrafluoroethylene plastic. It was a total disaster. He did four of them, none of them lasted much longer than six months, and he said, I'm out of this business. He got interested in fixing femoral neck fractures and replacing them with a prosthesis. He was using the Freddie Thompson prosthesis. Uh, it was suggested to him that he try dental acrylic cement. He got it from the Manchester Dental School. Uh, an engineer showed him, told, talked to him about it, told him how to use it. The little company that was making it, CMW, started making it and he used it, and when he started using it, it still had the pink color of dental. Yes, sir? Um, so, obviously, you know, you're It was exactly that. It was these were desperate patients. Uh, as a matter of fact, I will I will in a few minutes show you a very remarkable statistic and tell you a little story about the patient that'll answer that question for you. But the surgeons, all of them's attitude that you see, these guys are doing operations and the patients are failing. Their attitude was, I don't have anything else to offer, and if it fails, it's a girdle stone resection. Which is what, what I've given, which I would have given them in the first place, and I think the patients, although there's no documentation, I think the patients were informed of this. I, mean, I think these guys were all honest and very upfront. But he got this concept of using the cement as a grout, as a filling agent, to distribute the forces across the stem uniformly, and it worked remarkably well. He got his idea, right, who knows where he got the total idea for the arthroplasty. But about the time in 1958 when he started cementing the Freddie Thompsons, he took one of his patients to one of the regional meetings for orthopedic surgeons, which in those days, you, you could give a paper or you could bring in some patients and say, you know, I fix this guy's elbow and look how it works. And that was a standard way of going to meetings and you could bring patients. And uh, he was at a meeting where he was showing his cemented Freddie Thompson patient, and uh, McKee was showing one of his recently done metal on metal implants, and the guy was walking and Charlie said, this is so much better than arthrodesis the hip that I do, I think I'm gonna think about arthroplasty. So then he, quickly went to his idea of arthroplasty. He did his first one in 1962, and his concept was that it was a low friction arthroplasty. It had a press fit Teflon cup. He chose Teflon because it was the plastic on the market with the lowest coefficient of friction for available, and it had been used in, in human implants. It had been used in heart valves, and it had been in used in chin implants and some other things, and it appeared to be biocompatible. He had a cemented femoral stem. His stem was made uh, in a little laboratory there where he was, in a little machine shop. If you look at that stem, it started out as a 7 8 inch piece of stainless steel that was bent and then machined, because that's what the guy in his community could work with. They had a small head, seven eighths of an inch, it just happens to be almost 22 millimeters. 
and he thought that was ideal because his small head let him have more plastic in the socket side, and he knew that plastic would be the side that wore, so it would give him a longer time for it to wear. Unfortunately, he had some problems. The cast stainless was not nowhere near strong enough, and they broke at a significant rate. He eventually, three years in, I think, made contact with a small company that could cast chrome cobalt, uh, and they started making the stems at three years. But before they could start making them, he started thinking about the hip. And he said, you know, I'm not doing a hip replacement. I'm doing a hip reconstruction. And this is one of his cases. You'll notice that the acetabular component is very much medialized. You'll notice that the greater trochanter has been distalized. That decreased the body lever arm moment, increased the abductor lever arm moment. It decreased the force on his hip stem, and he thought would make his patients walk better quicker. Uh, but the real answer was he got new steel. You'll also notice that the, the cup position he felt was absolutely key. And he felt like you could position the cup best if you knew where the patient was. And the best way to know where the patient was to put them flat on their back. And if you had them lying flat on your back, then the only way the surgeon could do the surgery was sitting down at their side. And that's the way he did surgery. He sat and the patient was lying flat on their back. He put no antiversion into the cup, no antiversion into the femoral component. They both went in absolutely neutral. And he felt this was key because if you knew exactly where they were, then they wouldn't dislocate. And he, he did not have a big dislocation. Yes, sir. You said you used no, that was high density polyethylene in thin form double cup that he had problems with. Okay? So, and I'm going to get to the other. He also had a real problem with infection. He was operating in an old hospital, one very clean, and he developed, he decided, I can't, I can't do this. He developed the greenhouse. You see a picture of it there. It's a small house developed with an air conditioning company called Howarth that was in Manchester, where he was, near where he was. They also made his spacesuit for him. He felt like that there no, should be nobody in the operating theater where he was operating that wasn't necessary. He felt the anesthesiologist was unnecessary, so he put them outside the tent. You see them at the front. The only people that were to be in the tent, limit personnel, the only people to be in the tent were he, his nurse, and occasionally a registrar assistant that could kind of sit, stand and watch. And that was it. And he introduced the concept of surgical trays. And his idea was that a lot of infection occurred because of airborne bacteria and dirty back tables. He divided his operation, by doing this, he reduced his infection rate from 27% to 1%. That 1% has helped for over 30 years, reported results out of writing that are very accurate. Nobody, I don't think any other institution can, come, can talk that. He divided his operation into seven phases. Uh, each phase had a tray. And this happens to be a tray for taking off the trochanter and the initial approach. Uh, the little, uh, I'm going to ask a question. Who can tell me what that little structure is right there? I'm pointing to a right? four, five. The jiggly saw. Yeah, I'm used in neurosurgery. That was the way you cut off the femoral head. Remember, there was no power equipment at this time. Tray two was the acetabular preparation. And as you see, this is the power to the reamers. Uh, he drilled a hole in the femur, had a guide to do it. He deepened uh, the 
Astablum to uh, the level of getting medialized and then he expanded it. Very accurate way of doing hip all by hand. Uh, he did a total hip usually in around 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, he had problems with the, the Teflon cup. In the first two years, 225 of them, he, he put in 280, 225 of them had failed between two to four years. And when I say failed, it wasn't just that they look like that, it was that the hip looked like this. Massive osteolysis. Osteolysis equivalent to what you're seeing with metal on metal now. Uh, Lady Charnley in later years commented that she would often get up during this era and see uh, John Charnley sitting in his office with his head in his hand saying, what am I going to do with all these patients? He was not cavalier. He cared about his patients. But many of these patients are reported to have come back to him and said, you know, I had such a good two years before you had to take out my hip. Couldn't you just put another one of those in? And if it would give me two or three more years, it would be worth it. So people appreciated it, even, they were, even though they were failing at a rapid rate. He got on to highest polyethylene, and within four years of his starting in 1962, within four years, he had his operation and his materials perfected, and he was doing the standard Charnley total hip, as you see here, with high density polyethylene, and that hip became the gold standard for hip arthroplasty. And I think if you look at the long term results, 30-year results, it is still the gold standard. Uh, McKee quickly saw that, that Charnley cement was the way to fix implants, and so he started fixing his implant with cement. The reason you don't see the cement is that in the early days, there was no barium in it, so you didn't see it on next turn. Stanmore, uh, hospital started the Stanmore hip and also started a big institution for our research in, in biomechanics of the hip. Uh, ring over at the Red Hill Hospital uh, said, you know, I don't think cement's quite necessary. Uh, I think the Austin War will work quite good. He had been doing hip fusions by driving a Smith Pete nail up through the, the uh, posterior column and uh, then attaching a side plate on it. He said it would be very simple to put a screw up there with an acetabular component on it, and it would be quite stable. So the, he developed this metal on metal cementless prosthesis. Ling over at the Exeter, Exeter Hospital in 1969 really thought that the stem could be improved if it would settle into the cement mantle, and he started the the Ling, uh, or the extra hip, and that became a very widely used hip. You'll hear more about it later. Orthopedic industry in the 60s, there were four main companies. Austin All, which in 1970 split off and became Palmetica, and Austin All became a dental manufacturer. Uh, Zimmer, the Pew, and Richards were all in Zimmer, uh, in uh, Warsaw. Uh, so. U.S. had an industry, and these were the companies, but they were very small, they were privately held, they were very unsophisticated, they had no real Ph.D. type engineers working at them. Uh, the implants were really a minor part of their business. They primarily made braces, traction equipment, plaster Paris stuff. Uh, implants were a very, very small part of their business. And they were controlled by good manufacturing principles, and that is the owner's honesty. In the U.S., at the end of the 60s, about the time I, fin I finished my residency in 69, if you were talking to anybody, any older orthopedic surgeon, they were still talking cup arthroplasty. Dr. Coleman was doing 
cup arthroplasty every one to two weeks here in University Hospital. Uh, you made rounds on those patients for three months. Three months. We had a lot of patients in the hospital. The biggest challenge was figuring out what new to say to a patient after you've been seeing them for about a month or two. And they're laying there in traction. But anyhow, uh, the general thinking was metal's good, nah, plastic. Yeah, Charney had a bad time with that. Uh, Jude had a bad time with it. Uh, I think we better stay away from plastic. But the fixation at Polymethyl methacrylate may be it. So early on, the McKeeferar was the implant, kind of the implant of choice, cemented, metal on metal. Uh, Charney Mueller took over later. Uh, you might say, why weren't people doing Charnley's? Charnley would not allow his implant or his tools to go to anyone that hadn't spent a few weeks training with him, and the waiting list to get to him in 1970 was already two or three years long. So surgeons were looking for other choices. McKee Farrar was the first hip I put in. I had seen McKee do one as a visiting professor at Baylor when I was a resident, and I, I did my first one here in uh, January 1970. And I did that prosthesis for about a year and then switched over to the turn of Mueller. Uh, and this is a patient from that early era. And they did very well. And they remarkably, we had them in the hospital less, less than two weeks, sometime 10 days even. And it, it was, a, people thought it was a miracle. And patients were walking the day after surgery. And it really, really took off. In the fall of 1970, because of some deaths that had occurred in England and in the U.S., with, when the cement was inserted into the, into the femur, uh, there had been some hypotensive episodes, patients dying, and the anesthesiologist could smell the, uh, the monomer coming out of the patient's lungs. And so it was obvious the cement was circulating in the bloodstream, and that made it a drug, and that made it under the FDA's purview. And they said, okay, you've got to stop implementing material until we know what's in it. It was all being made by this small company in London, CMW, and the FDA said, you must tell us what, what you're doing, what you're making this with, before we give you permission to use it. And this required revealing trade secrets. The mixture <clears throat> of the dimethylperitoluidine and benzoyl peroxide is what determines how fast this sets and what, how much it links. And that is a trade secret. It's, it was not patentable, but CMW knew that if they gave it to the FDA, that somebody would start using it and they would lose their exclusive right to it. And they were selling, selling it worldwide. They were having a difficult time making, making enough of it. And they told the FDA, nah, we aren't going to do that. The FDA said, okay, we're stopping it. But there was some strong lobbying against it and they partially capitulated. They said, we'll allow it to come in to one surgeon in a geographic area if he will apply and we will give him a number, it's called the number. You got the number, then you could do, you could get cement and do it. It required sending the FDA your curriculum vitae. And uh, most surgeons were just too bullheaded to do that, to, to send their data to the government. So a lot, nobody, not many people applied for it. Uh, and early on, I happened to think it was a good thing to do, and I, I, I had a CV, not very long, but I had one. And uh, I had to agree to do patients all over 70 and to, quote, send my results to the FDA. They didn't even send me a form of how to send them. I mean, I don't know how I was supposed to send them, but that, that was the agreement. And so we continued doing hips here. Uh, 
in the community, in the community, they couldn't get the, the cement. So they turned, the community turned to the Peter Ring implant, as you see here, for use in that, that period when the FDA wouldn't allow a cement. And a lot of them went in, in the years that followed, we took a lot of them out, almost all of them. And, you know, we could see black sludge in them. Uh, in general, loosening was the real problem with this. We did not see big osteolysis like you saw it, but you're seeing in this generation in metal of metal. In 19, because of general pressure, uh, especially from legislators who were being told by their orthopedic surgeon, I can't do your hip the, the good way because I don't have cement. Pressure came on and there was a general release of the cement. It required that people come to an institution and quote, be educated on it. We ran the course here on, on total hips and, and cement. But it started generally in the US uh, the wide use of cement and total hips, as you see here. And there was kind of a honeymoon period. It, it looked good and, and everybody was doing them. And not a lot of bad things were happening, but like all, all things, it came to an end and we started seeing some, some fractured stems. The FDA had been really wanting to get into the regulation of surgical implants and there was a need for it, there's no question, but they used this as a, a way to get started. They said, we need to know more about orthopedic implants. They put out a proposal, a request for proposal to answer, to do research in this area. Uh, it was a national RFP. Dan Daniels was in the uh, bioengineering department over at uh, the U Utah Biomedical Testing Laboratory working on the artificial heart. He and I uh, went together and got the, that uh, request for proposal and got that grant. That started the Orthopedic Bioengineering Laboratory in Humida today. That's where it came from. Dan became full-time uh, with us and we trained in quite a number of PhDs and, and uh, in engineering and as well as master students. Uh, our study was unique uh, in a kind of a way. The resident staff at that time circulated to six, six hospitals here in the city. And the deal was any orthopedic implant that came out in any hospital, the resident on Grand Rounds Day, which then was Tuesday, brought the implants back and we took them to the lab and looked at them and analyzed them, all that stuff. We also ordered in a large number of, of off-the-shelf implants and analyzed them for their metal content and their finish and were they well made. Uh, this happens to be one case that came out of it. It's Charlie type implant. Uh, it broke here. It was easy when we got a new one of these to see what the problem was. In the finishing process, they clamped it right there so the guy that was polishing it could polish the head. It caused a stress riser that resulted in a fracture. But the general result, well, this happened to be another case that we got the implant out of. It was a, a intertrope that went to a non-union and the implant broke. There was nothing wrong with this implant. It was very well made, right steel, et cetera. Any implant, orthopedic implant, uh, for a trochanteric non-union, is going to break from fatigue. That was not the implant's fault. In general, the results of our study was that the materials were good, the manufacturing was good, the labeling was poor, and the packaging was even worse. <laughs> this was one of the cases that we had we brought in. And this is a Steinman pen threaded on one end. It came in a, in a, uh, a plastic bag that was supposedly sterile, but to keep the sharp end from going through the plastic bag, they glued a little envelope like on the end of it. The envelope was glued with horsehair glue. And so this threaded piece that was to go into a femur uh, was full of horsehair glue. I mean, it was 
just poor packaging. Uh, I don't think that study really drove it, but it was part of it. In 73, Congress legislated the FDA to regulate orthopedic devices. This, I think, was necessary. The industry and I think orthopedic surgeons weren't happy having the government get into their life, but it did. Uh, three years later, the FDA implemented their uh, regulation by issuing the medical device amendments. It classified orthopedic devices. Class one were braces, tools, jigs, guides, things that didn't go in the human body, and it was felt these could still be done with good manufacturing principles. But basically, the honesty of the people making it. Existing implants were assumed to be safe and effective. In other words, if we'd been using a jet Jewett nail for 10 years and we were happy with it, then, then the, they said, okay, that, that's, it's safe and effective based on the experience to date. But they also said, for a new implant, we will assume it is essentially safe and effective if it is essentially equivalent to an old implant. To get it required you file a 510K form, you'll hear this referred to. A 510K was a detailed description of the implant, what it was made of, how it was made, what its dimensions were, uh, what kind of testing had been done, and they said, and we will ultimately come up with performance standards for everything being made. Uh, they tried that, it, it's partially accomplished. And then they said there will be new implants that will require pre-market approval and studies to prove safety and effect, efficacy just like a drug. Obviously, if you were gonna bring out a new uh, intermediary nail, a new total hip, this is going to be a very, very expensive way to do it. Everybody knew that this was gonna be the route that all new stuff would go. And early on, it was. People were knocking off the charney, new, new companies were starting, and, and in order to get competition, you know, they had to do something, so they would have a knockoff of a, of a hip that they, somebody else was producing, and they might change the head size from 28 to 27 millimeters, various little tricks. But things rocked along pretty well for a year or two. There was a great deal of change in the industry this time. All of the implant uh, that we were making, and they were vastly, I mean, the, the incidence of, of use of implants was skyrocketing, and they were very profitable. All of the orthopedic companies were bought by a big pharma. Zimmer went to Bristol Myers. Uh, Pfizer bought Halmedica, et cetera, et cetera. This gave a big increase to the budgets. Uh, manufacturing became very sophisticated. All of the companies had their own labs. They had their own PhD engineers, their own design PhDs. They had all the equipment they needed. The company started developing implants with design teams, not a surgeon who thought it up, scratched it down on a cocktail napkin, and handed it to a a salesman said, could you guys make this for me? They developed surgical teams and they, the developer surgeons worked with the engineers of the company, who were high level engineers, to bring out implants. COVID. And also, in this era, the first big lawsuits were seen. Reaction to the big lawsuits, the companies reacted. Uh, uh, People using chrome, how medical specifically using chrome cobalt had always cast it and then polished the head and it left a, a fairly large grain structure. Uh, in the several, probably a hundred thousand of these that were put in, three broke. The three that broke all settled for around $300,000 and this scared the companies to death and all of the companies said, oh, we can't have this. So they started forging the cast chrome cobalt. This meant that you then had a machine, you heat this, you beat it, and it made the crystalline structure 
smaller and it made it much stronger. And it tripled the price. Started going. About this time, the computer assisted design came into the world because computers were coming into the world. And all the companies bought CAD systems. And they started advertising the academy. Oh, we've got a computer assisted design STEM. They were just straighter uh, and fatter. What they did was they changed the moment arm on the hip and made it much smaller. So the stems didn't break, but patients had a harder time walking without an abductor lurch. The 70s also a change for orthopedic surgeons. Subspecialties began in, in force. Uh, biomechanics became the dominant science. Uh, one-fifth of the orthopedic in training exam when I was a, a resident, one-fifth was to follow. One-fifth. Biomechanics came on in 1968 as part of the OITE. The orthopedic residents did very poorly on it. In 1969, I got here, uh, and Dr. Coleman said, you're going to teach biomechanics. We're going to, we're going to know something about it. I said, I'll learn to spell it, and then I'll start teaching it. <laughs> and uh, research gained attention. And this is, this is one of the exciting things about the 70s. Uh, around the country, people started analyzing their failures and then doing research to explain why it occurred. And uh, studies on forces in the hip and what have you were being widely done. In the 1970s, the Orthopedic Research Society was infinitely more fun and exciting to attend than was uh, the Academy. And it was, it, the Orth Orthopedic Research Society had almost, you know, it would be full, and 90% of the people in there were practicing orthopedic surgery. And what you saw this year was what you were going to be seeing on the exhibit floor in a year or two. It was, it was really an exciting time. Uh, one of the solutions for the problems that were being seen in the, in the, on the femoral side uh, had been proposed in 1972 by Michael Freeman in London, Imperial College of London Hospital, and his engineering partner, Al Swanson. And in 1972, uh, Freeman started putting in his double cup. This was not it. He first put in the plastic was on the femoral side and the metal was on the acetabular side. Uh, he did 80 cases in two years at a high enough failure rate that he could see this was unsuccessful and he switched it over to this particular configuration and he was talking about it as a solution. He said he saw no reason to sacrifice all this good bone uh, for a disease process that was only a few millimeters thick. Uh, in the mid-70s, joining him was Harlan Amstutz, Heinz Wagner, and Charles Townley, all who came out with their own and there were Several others came out with it. And this became a, a hip of very, very strong interest. Amstutz, as you know, has pursued this his whole career and has published good results through the years. But in general, uh, it didn't go that way. Uh, this is a, a, I think actually that's a Freeman Cup that, that, that Ken Samuelson did. He, when he was on our family, on our faculty, he had done a, a fellowship with Mike Freeman. Uh, but in general, they didn't do well, uh, and they didn't do well fast. I did. I went to Germany and spent three weeks with Heinz Wagner, and came back and started doing them here. I did seventeen, and one of them survived and still survives. All the other sixteen, I, I personally revised. Uh, about that time, we discovered cement disease. And everybody was terribly concerned with this lytic process that was occurring around implants. And when you looked at it under an H&E Spain, all you saw was cement. And this was a problem that was going to have to be solved. And the solution uh, was bioingrowth prosthesis. This was, I think, the first one in the United States, the uh, AML anatomic medullary locking, 
It was made by Depew. It, they just took their Moore stem and made it solid and coated it uh, with a chrome cobalt bead. Uh, a lot of people referred to it as the Mod Moore instead of the AML, but that was the bead structure. Uh, How Medica responded with their uh, bead, larger bead structure. And all of these bead structures, the real issue was that you had to have the, the stem, then you had to put the bead on it, then you had to put the, the, the thing in the furnace and fire it up to a point that the beads, because of their increased surface area, would start to melt and meld together before the stem changed its shape. It really was a manufacturing challenge and one that there were some problems with. A lot of these beads shed. Zimmer's answer was uh, a titanium mesh. And their problem was that when they, they couldn't get this to really bond tight enough to put it all the way around, and sometimes these shed. Eventually, the manufacturers developed techniques for making each one of the processes reliable. They were expensive processes. Zimmer went to diffusion bonding. I don't have time to go into how that worked, but it did work. You could make the titanium stick to the implant without changing the structure of the, of the uh, stem itself. And then a bunch of others came out. But as they were going through that three or four year period of uh, problems with it, with beads being seen in the interface of between the cup and causing the need for revision. The FDA came out, or the, no, no, this is another thing. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, I think one of the real problems that occurred here, all of this was costing the companies a phenomenal amount of money. And they were saying, you gotta get the implants out by Academy so we can get our money back on what we're investing in these processes. And you look at how the process was, and I was part of it. Engineers and developer surgeons would design implants and instruments, and the engineers would do some static and dynamic testing on them and say, oh yeah, this thing ain't gonna fatigue fracture on you. Uh, we would put the implant into cadaver to see that we could do it, and then implant it into start implanting patients and uh, have all of two or three month follow up and the implant would be released for sale at the next academy. And that's, this is a vicious cycle that was really bad uh, because a lot of implants were coming out without really any, any, not even a year's experience. The FDA responded by saying, hmm, Maybe we've been defining this new and pre-existing wrong. Matter of fact, especially for these bio in growth total hips, they are not pre-existing. Those are new implants and they should go through pre-market approval. And they said, we're gonna stop manufacturing of these. Uh, this essentially equivalent was the real key issue. And when they said they're gonna stop manufacturing, by this time, these implants were working, they had been on the market, and they were probably dominating three to one over cement hips. They were the hip stem of choice in the United States. And they, they, were, you know, they said, this can't be, the surgical community, the surgical community said, you can't take our stems away from us. <laughs> One of the responses was, all of the companies said, oh, we'll just put it in our brochure. We're just gonna put a note in each one of these, not for use with cement. And they did. And they said, told the FDA, see, we're, we're not manufacturing those for bioing growth. The FDA said, come on, guys. We know you are, you're telling the surgeons to put them in. So they said, no, no, so we're telling the surgeons, and they did put a little dab of cement on the end of this thing when you shove it in, and then you can say, see, I used it with cement. That was crazy. But it looked like 
they were, FDA was about to shut down, and it was really distressing. The Academy came to the rescue. They said, look, if you guys will work this out, we are, the Academy was coming up right away. They said, we're going to not allow the showing of any of those implants on the Academy floor uh, until both sides have worked out an agreement as to what's that. For two years, uh, that occurred. These, these were not shown on the Academy floor. Uh, they could be shown in a locked uh, cabinet, but they couldn't have any notes with it or anything else. And they, the salesmen weren't allowed to stand there and talk to patients. People are surgeons about it. And after two years, the there was an agreement agree, uh, arrived at that they would grandfather the older one of these and further uh, ones that would get to come in, but that they were going to clamp down on uh, st other stems as they came out. And they did to some degree. About that time, we really discovered that cement disease was not cement disease, but was particle disease. Uh, when people started looking at this tissue, uh, it's something other than H&E, because in the H&E process, the polyethylene gets dissolved. So you never saw the polyethylene. And when you started looking at the reaction, you could see that it was really polyethylene was the principal culprit. Any particle can cause this reaction, metal, uh, plastic, and what have you, if it's the right size and the right biomaterial. It just so happens that polyethylene was pretty uh, non-biomechanical in its particular form. Yes, sir. Well, you could see the wear, but in the tissue, you couldn't see the wear particle. So it was just assumed that wear particles were being absorbed into the uh, into the old system and being taken away. People didn't realize that they, that until uh, I, I believe Bill Harris's lab was the first one to document what was really happening. But it took two or three years. Uh, that got us into the revision business. Up until these implants came out, we were having to revise everything with primary implants. And it was, as a, the SROM was the first one that became available. Uh, about 1980, uh, started using that one. Wagner came very shortly thereafter, and then the AML. Uh, all of these have their advantages and their disadvantages. Uh, Charlie Ng was behind the, the AML, and he was a very honest and good guy. For some reason, I never really used his implant, but I followed his work closely. He's a good friend. He's been here, known him for a long time. He was very honest. He pointed out that they had a real problem with stress shielding of some of their implants. And he reported it and he said, yeah, this looks horrible, but our results aren't bad. These patients aren't hurting and we're not having to revise them. And he pointed out that, that the problem was in the stiffness of the stem and it had to do with the fact that the stiffness is the fifth power of the radius which meant that in an array of stems, you could easily use the small one, but the big one was gonna cause this problem. This became a very widely used revision implant, especially for people that had used it uh, as a primary. Uh, I think the reason it didn't go for us was because we never used it as a primary and we felt uncomfortable with that scratch fit in a, in a real short thing. But anyhow, it was you. For the late 90s, People were saying, well, maybe cement isn't so bad an idea. And we got the revision, uh, the third and fourth generation cement technique. Uh, people started uh, uh, looking at this. It actually, in practice, didn't work out quite as well. And the interest, especially in the US, was very short lived. Uh, probably one of the reasons was that most US surgeons went with the thinking of the cement should bond to the metal on the femoral stem. Ling had been preaching against that and said you should have it smooth, polished, and tapered and let it settle. We didn't. 
Uh, maybe if we'd gone this route, we would still be enthusi enthusiastic for cement, but we didn't, and, and across the country, cement really lost its favor. Ng made a strong case for using cement with his impaction grafting technique, uh, but uh, that again is not something that's been widely accepted, especially here. Stem of this type was very common, uh, available in the 90s. Uh, this happened to be the one I was affiliated with, but all the companies had one similar to this, diaph seal fitting, proximally coated, something either titanium or, or chrome cobalt that the body could grow into, maybe hydroxyapatite coated, but something like this, and they were giving very, very good results. Uh, Wear and particle disease, though, was an issue of the 90s. And it was an issue because we were seeing wear and we definitely were seeing particle disease. We had been exposed to several attempts to try to improve polyethylene. This was a carbon fiber reinforced, didn't work. This was a, 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 mo a heat press that didn't work. Uh, Heilmer came out with a great fanfare in 1990 at the Academy. It was a joint venture between du du Dupuy and DuPont. It had a lot of people strongly backing it with data and what have you. All of these points were made. But when it started being used, the wear particles were extremely osteolytic. And it was pulled off the market about 1996. And uh, so there was a bad taste in the late 90s in people's mouth about plastic. And this was about the time that Crosslink Poly was being talked about, shown, and everybody that was working with it was said, this is gonna be the answer. But a lot of the surgeons said, huh, you know, you've told us that about four or five plastics, and they haven't worked. So we're looking for an alternative. But let's look at metal on metal, ceramic on ceramic. Uh, the metal on metal came out, was really being popularized by people in Europe. Uh, they were saying, you know, we aren't seeing any bad results. They weren't lying. But what you don't know is that in those days in Europe, a surgeon did his surgery and told the patient, if, if you have troubles, come back and see me. And they, they didn't have any kind of long-term follow-up. And so they weren't lying to us when they said, we aren't seeing problems, but they weren't looking for it. But the metal on metal, really took a, a strong interest and took off. And I think the thing that, one of the arguments was, well, you, you guys all put them in back when you were putting in the key for ours, and those people did okay, didn't they? Well, remember, we were doing patients over 70, at least over 65. And in that era, Mike Freeman had done some work with the debris in a, a simulation machine out of one of these articulations, showing really bad reactions in animals to that debris. And he was, he strongly preached against chrome cobalt bearing surfaces. And I think a lot of people remember that. I happened to have been one of them and thought that was a really bad idea. But it took off. Ceramic on ceramic had always been of interest to us. <laughs> and this one took off because one of the first ones they put in was in Jack Nichols. And this was about the time that the uh, direct consumer advertising was being released and done. And uh, it was the Pew, this was the Pew's. And they advertised, you know, look, if you want to play golf like Jack Nichols, get one of these hits. And this thing took off and, and ran like mad until they started squeaking and until they started having some ceramic fractures. We went through a phase of what I consider silly things. This is a slide of mine from 2010, and I still feel this way. So I think cementless fixation, especially in my, hand, in my hands, is the way to go. I never got good to see. I think metal crosslink poly, uh, metal on crosslink poly is a way to go. I, I could be talked into using ceramics now that they're much better. Uh, I think standard length thermal stems I don't have anything against those funny looking little things that I see in conference, but if you think you're saving somebody by not putting that much metal in their femur, uh, I don't think it's worth the learning. Uh, 
wounds still heal side to side, not end to end. I think it was silly to go to this minimal surgery. If I have a total hip, I want you to be able to see what you're doing. Don't damage my tissue by pulling on it excessively. I think this may be one of the reasons the minimal surgery may be one of the reasons the infection rate is up and wound, wound, wounds don't look as good as they used to. But that's all an old man talking and how to date. Uh, current implants at that time were excellent. Why try something new without some follow-up? Thank you guys very much. Any other questions? Why not? What if? Well, I think somebody like, let's just pick a name. I think it's all right for Chris Pelt to say, I'm going to do a hundred of this new implant and see how they work. If he follows them and if he reports the results, good or bad. But that's different than the implant coming out and somebody taking it to Logan and a surgeon up there say, well, I think I'll try one. Now he tries one, and then they take one down to St. George, and he tries two. And then they take one out to St. Mark's, and they try four. But you get no follow-up, and it, there's no, no way of knowing whether they're going to be good or bad until finally somebody looks up and says, you know, all around the community, we're seeing these things fail. And, and that's, so I think, I think uh, designer surgeons should feel free to take off and do it, but just Follow them in a port, and they do now. They do now. Yeah, I, uh, so I, I think that's a good point. I think the real answer is for, for not just community surgeon. I mean, it, let's say you become the, the joint surgeon at Colorado in their academic department. You probably should be doing the implants that you know work and work for you. And if you're going to start with something new, do it with a plan and protocol in mind, not just randomly try. Dr. Coleman used to always say, do everything the same way every time. Then if something starts going wrong, you can start looking for the answer. But if you're doing an operation, you know, you're doing a triple and you put a staple in this one and you put a Steinman pin across that one and then all of a sudden you look up and you say, well, you know, I've got too high non-union rate, you got no idea why. You don't know whether it was the Steinman pen or the staple or the screw that you put across. So I think that's a good principle. Do every operation the same way every time until you got a reason to change. Yes, sir. What is my thought on robotics, technology, etc.? I think it's a gimmick to sell uh, technology. If I were paying for it, if I were the uh, Aetna or if I were United Health, I would tell you, I'm going to pay you X amount to do a total hit. And if you get good results, I'm going to keep sending you patients. And if you want to use that piece of equipment, that's fine. You and your hospital pay for it. As a payer of health care, I wouldn't pay a penny for it. I'd rather hire a good surgeon that I know could do it and pay him double the fee for a surgery and let him use his brain and his hands than pay, you know, $3,000 for the use of some, some piece of equipment that's not necessary. It may be necessary to make the occasional surgeon, if he's got enough salesman in the office with him, in the room with him, or with him, be able to, to put a hip in in the right position. But that's not the answer. The answer is have somebody do it that does it regularly, and does it well, and does it quick. All right. Thanks a lot for the help getting me set up. I appreciate it. I just am not used to